Well, thank you for your attentiveness and your great questions. I want to talk in the second session about Mount Ebal. So let me set the stage. This is another important conquest site, and that's the area of my research focus. I also deal with Mount Ebal in the uh, chapter of Zondervan's new text called Five Views on the Exodus. So if you were to buy a copy of that book, my kids would be able to eat for another week. Um, no, my kids are all grown, but my grandkids would be able to eat for another week. Uh, no, seriously, you, you would probably enjoy it, and I deal with the various conquest sites. But I'm going to zero in, after having talked about Jericho last night and Shiloh in the last session, on Mount Ebal. In Deuteronomy 27, Moses, knowing that he was dying at Shittim, was giving some final instructions to Joshua and the Israelites. And after he wrote the book of Deuteronomy, then he went up on Mount Nebo, and there he died. They crossed over from there. He told them this, when you enter the land and you gain a foothold, and I take that to mean Jericho and I, you come into the land and you gain a foothold, go north with Mount Gerizim on one side and Mount Ival on the other side with the Ark of the Covenant in the middle. He's very specific, the Levites and the Ark of the Covenant in the middle, and pronounce blessings from Mount Gerizim. He's talking about Deuteronomy 27, 28, and 29, the blessings and curses. And, and pronounce the curses from Mount Ebal, and there you will renew covenant with me. S specifically, Moses tells them what to do. Moses dies, Joshua's in charge, they cross the Jordan, they have victory at Jericho, they're defeated at Ai, then they have victory at Ai, and at the end of Joshua chapter 8, they do what Moses told them to do. They head north uh, to Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal, and they renew covenant there. Joshua 8.30 says that Joshua built an altar on Mount Ebal. The question is, is there archaeological evidence of that altar? Has that altar been found? It's at a site called El Bernat on Mount Ebal. So here's what Larry Steger had to say. Now, Larry was the uh, dean at Harvard University, so he must know what he's talking about. And Steger said, if there's an altar on Mount Ebal, as Zertal, talking about Adam Zertal, who in the 1980s found this site, uh, we biblical scholars should all go back to kindergarten. Well, Larry, guess what? <laughs> we have an altar on Mount Ebal, and he's 91 years old. He's going to look kind of silly in kindergarten, but uh, such is the state of affairs. Now, Zertal, from 1982 to 1987, excavated a large rectangular altar from the 13th century B.C. Now, the Bible says that the Exodus happened in 1446 B.C., they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, and they come into the land in about 1406 at the end of the 15th century B.C. So this, 13th, this altar, this rectangular altar, that's not from the period of Joshua. He found a 13th century B.C. altar that covered an older round altar, and there has been a lot of attention about that rectangular altar. In fact, I'm teaching an online course right now. Next, You can still get in on it if you, if you want, joshualtar.com. Next Sunday after church, people from all over the world will be, I'm preaching somewhere in Texas next Sunday, and then afterward, they're all going to, well, probably not all of them, but anybody who wants to is going to stay around, and I'm going to do this, this lecture on Mount Ebal. So if you want more after today, you can tune in uh, next week and get more. But all the attention has been on this rectangular altar, and they're missing the point. The point is there's a round altar underneath it that that rectangular altar is preserving that does date to the time of Joshua. So uh, what I'm saying is that strat what Zertal called Stratum II, and incidentally, Zertal was a secularist. He was an atheist, like all the professors at Tel Aviv University. He did not believe in God. He was hostile toward it. He was raised on a kibbutz, and all the kibbutzim in Israel, they're all communists. I mean, so he, that's all he was raised with. That's all he knew. He was a war hero, had his legs hurt very, very badly in, uh, in the war, then went on to become an archaeologist on crutches. So quite a feat, you know, to traipse all over the, the world and have the career that he had while on crutches. But he was a secularist. He did not believe in the biblical account. thought it was all mythology until he found this altar on Mount Ebal and Adam Zertal became a believer. This did not bless his colleagues at Tel Aviv. Adam's off the reservation. What are we going to do with Adam? Can you imagine the conversations they had behind his back when he was not around? I mean, can you believe what Adam is saying? How can he be saying this? 
the Bible is a reliable historical document, Zertal was just going where the evidence led him, all right? So that's what we're going to explore. The issue is geometry. The round altar lies at the perfect geometric center of the later altar. Now, folks, things don't happen symmetrically and geometrically accidentally, okay? So it's at the perfect geometric center. It's being venerated. We call this a timenas. It's venerating what happened on that spot. And at, at, at El Bernat, whoever built these altars used unworked field stones. Now, this is a requirement given to us by Moses, Joshua chapter 8, Numbers 27, unworked field stone that has now, some of it, been plastered over, and we have evidence of that plaster. Now, I got involved because it's a conquest site, and not many people knew about it. Zertal died, unfortunately, before he could do his final publication, so not a lot of attention had gone to this, and I thought that it was a very, very significant site. And um, we led a team, or I was the, the director of the project, but it was a whole consortium of people, but I was able to lead this group in December of 2019 to Mount Ival, which is in about the most politically sensitive area of Israel that you could ever go to, okay? So you're in Area B, which is under Israeli military control and Palestinian civil control. I mean, you think you got trouble. <laughs> you talk about hypersensitive, and through a series of miracles, really, we were able to get permission to relocate Zertal's dump pile from where it was to a place we were staying at Shabbos Shomron, and I built a provisional wet sifting station with the goal of wet sifting Zertal's dump pile to see if we could find things that would give us additional evidence that would shed light. The politics simply will not allow additional excavation at this point. Now, here's the altar. As you approach on Mount Ival, very, very few people ever go there because it's hard to get to. You, you have to have a military escort. You're supposed to have a bulletproof bus that you go on and blah, 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 blah to get there. They're really making much more of it than it, than it is. But uh, when you get there, it's in a large footprint-shaped enclosure. There are six of these foot-shaped enclosures up the Jordan Valley. So as you're going from south to north, you've got a footprint-shaped enclosure at Ar Argaman, and then another one, then another one, then another one, then another one. And then the final one is at Mount Ebal, which is very interesting. You know, you think about what God promised Abram. Wherever your feet touch, I'm going to give you. And here they're building these very large, foot, maybe four times, five times, six times the size of your sanctuary here. These foot-shaped enclosures with altars inside them. Probably the Gilgalim, where the Israelites are in camping. But this is what you see when you are approaching and here's my team, several, maybe three winters ago, as we're going to visit it, and we're talking about the project that we would like to do at this point, the hill is so steep to go down it, if you're just walking, you would slip going down this steep hill. So we knew like this was going to be a problem. So one of the things I told the regional council that I would require, as if I had leverage, but that I would require if we were going to do this, would be that they pave, at their expense, that they pave that portion of the road, and when they wrote me back and said, okay, it's paved, what do you want next? I thought, okay, you know, it seems like things are going to happen. And they just continued to fall into line for us. Uh, this is looking down at the altar. And the round altar is right here underneath this. And here's a ramp leading up to it, just like the Mishnaic, Talmudic, uh, later Second Temple period altar. So this is very fascinating. And it's full of archaeological material. It's datable material. And uh, you can get, get a little idea here of, uh, let's see if this would, yeah, here's our little video. So you can sort of see the drone footage of how it rotates around. Now, it was covered intentionally. When Zertal found it, it was like a mantle or a blanket. It had been intentionally covered up with stone. It hadn't worn out like you would normally get over time. It wasn't destroyed. It was intentionally buried. So as they uncovered that mantle, that blanket, this is what they found. So it's a gorgeous area. And this is on the backside of Mount Ibal. So the, the covenant ceremony was like this. Ancient Shechem is in the middle, and I'll show you a picture of, of Shechem. This is where Abram, Isaac, and Jacob have deep ties. This is where Joseph is buried. When Joseph was in Egypt and he knew he was going to die, he made them promise they would take his bones with him when they left Egypt. 
And where did they bury his bones? At Shechem. So the ancient Shechemites, when the Israelites go there to renew covenant, there's no battle. They don't fight the people of Shechem like they had fought at some other places. The people of Shechem join with the Israelites. They have apparently embraced Yahwehism, monotheism, and they join in with them in this covenant renewal ceremony. And the Bible puts it this way, all Israel joined together, alien and citizen alike joined together and renewing covenant with Yahweh. So these people have embraced the God of the Israelites, or maybe they've known him all along, going back to their deep patriarchal ties. But with half of the tribes of Israel on Mount Gerizim pronouncing blessings, and half on Mount Ebal with the Ark of the Covenant and the Levites in the middle. So let me just kind of illustrate for you how this worked. <clears throat> the people on Mount Ebal, <coughs> pardon me, would pronounce the blessings. So let's say you guys on this half, you're Mount Gerizim, you get the blessings, and you guys are Mount Ebal. Sorry, you get the curses, all right? And um, so the people on Mount Gerizim would cry out, Blessed is the man who honors his father and his mother. The people on Manibal would answer back, yes and amen. Then from Manibal, they would echo, cursed is the man who does not honor his father and his mother. It would echo across the valley. The people from Mount Gerizim would answer, answer back, yes and amen. Get the idea. Cursed is the man who worships an idol. Blessed is the man who does not worship an idol. So this goes back and forth all day long. That's how they renew their covenant with God. So it's right after victory at Ai. Next comes Mount Ival. So when you go on Mount Ival, can you find an altar there? Joshua 8.30 says that Joshua built an altar on Mount Ival. He sacrificed there to the Lord on behalf of the Israelites. There is an altar there. You cannot deny it. It's a rectangular altar, and he, Zertal was correct that it dates to the 13th century B.C. Our interest is in the round altar that's underneath it and the dating of that altar. And here's what it looks like. Zertal called it installation. I mean, he identified it. It's in his provisional reports that were published in the Tel Aviv Journal, um, but it's just there, but it's been ignored. It's two by two meters, and we recreated it. We took stone from Mount Ibal, from our, the sifting project, and we rebuilt a replica of that two-by-two-meter altar. Uh, it's, it's there, and it's full of ash and bone and cultic material. And I believe that it does date to the late 15th century B.C. Now, here's the replica that we built next to the place where we were staying. As we were wet sifting the soil, there's a lot of stone that's in that soil, and so we would of course, save that stone, and that's what we use to rebuild this replica. That's Perry, who was my chief engineer, and uh, we look very happy. Remember that shared suffering is redemptive, so look very happy. Here I am on top of that round altar. Now, you can see, this is what in the winter, sometimes you get gorgeous days. We're wearing shorts, it's sunny and 60, and it's gorgeous, and then you get some not-so-nice days. But look right here, that's the turn of that round altar that Zertal had had exposed, and you can see it right there. And I'm not an overly emotional person, but I have to tell you, at that spot, it was pretty overwhelming as I realized that, that Joshua ben Nun had stood where I, was, where I was sitting and that the world did not yet know about it and that we would have the opportunity to tell the world about it. It was pretty, pretty awesome and pretty overwhelming. And here's the provisional wet sifting station that we built. It only cost me $500 to build. It's a water tank and a water pump, and we hook it up so that we've got water pressure, and we're able to recycle the water through there. When I left after, after a month, I sold it for $1,000 to Haifa University. Don't tell them I made a profit on them, okay? Because I wanted other teams to start wet sifting as well, so they bought it from me for $1,000. They were bringing students by to see what we were doing and how we were doing it. So you see these white, what, what are called in Hebrew, balas, or big bags of soil uh, from the dump pile. So we're going through those. We're first dry sifting them, then we're wet sifting them, and then we're examining the material that's in there to see what may have been missed in the 1980s that may shed additional light. We're also doing flotation on the soil so that the seeds will come to the surface. We can recover those so we can analyze seed and bone and pottery and flint and, you know, anything that they may have missed. Now, I have to tell you this, Zertal was very thorough. In comparison to, say, Finkelstein, we, went to, we did Finkelstein's uh, dump pile from the 1980s at Shiloh, 
it was just full of archaeological material. So there wasn't as much in Zertales, but <laughs> what we did find was potentially earth-shattering. I suppose you'd like to know what it was. All right, well, you got to watch a little video first. Okay, welcome to the Meds Project, the Mount Ebal Dump Salvage. This is day two, and you can see that we are up and running now. We've got all of our uh, sifted material that is now soaking so that then can be dry sifted. This is Emmeline who's working with this. And there's Abigail was just helping me sort yesterday's pottery. And Gary is off to go get something important. And you can see here our provisional uh, wet sifting station we were using while we were building our new one that's about to be up and running. Here's the sacred soil that we've already sifted through and we're doing flotation on some of this also so that we can extract seeds. And here is our new wet sifter that we're building provisionally for this area. And here's Steve who masterminded the, the project. And looky here. We are going to be moving up in the world. Suzanne and Greg, say hi to the folks back hey. home. We're sending us money. There we go. And here's Melody, who's dry sifting away. Send money, send say, money. Say hi to yeah, That's right. Amen. Keep those checks coming. This is Jacob from Springtown. And Jacob's uh, working away here. When he's not eating cheese, he's working. And here's Terry. He got on my bad side, so he has to scrape the concrete. And... Uh, <laughs> Here's Brent working away, cleaning out the, the rock that's mixed in with the soil so that it'll be easier for us to dry sift and then to wet sift. And then here's Ellen, who's going fast at it. And these, these last two are Texans. And uh, you can see off in the distance, Mount Ibal. And then just that way would be ancient Samaria. And then just this way would be Mount Gerizim. And we've got a beautiful day. We're in short sleeves, working away and uh, just sorted our first day's uh, pottery and finds. Big stuff, so you guys keep praying for us. Appreciate your support. All right, well, that gives you a flavor for what the project was, was like. We stayed in those, those cabanas right there, so literally right next to the working area, so it's great we were able to work all day. Just get up in the morning, go to work, and keep working all day. Uh, and it was normally really great weather. That slab we're working on, there was a building there, a big storage building that had burned down the previous year. And so, fortuitously for us, we were able to just clean off the, the destruction that was there and then to use that slab, which was perfect for a winter project because you've got a little moisture that you're dealing with, and that's where we, where we based. All right, um, here's an excerpt from my book, Five Views. I see it, the round altar as more than one century older and believe that Zertal Stratum II should be subdivided and that the material just above bedrock in pit 250, surface 61, and installation 94 derives from the late bronze 1B. I propose that these loci and installations pertain to a different century. I call this Stratum 2B. So this is what I mean by engaging in the arena of ideas. You publish this stuff, you begin to debate it, you begin to go out public with it and to engage and say, okay, this is what Zertal said, he didn't finish his final publication, this is what you guys are saying, we think you're off on the date, here's why, um, and let's, let's dialogue, let's discuss. And uh, the question is, do we have good carbon dates? Do we have good scarab, glyptic type dates? Do we have pottery that dates to that time period? Because the truth is, what the, there's only one truth in this, okay? And I may be right, I may be wrong, but there's not two truths. One of them is right and the other is wrong. Is there evidence that supports what I believe it to be? So here we are, you know, examining the, the pottery. Uh, we took about 350 diagnostic sherds and several thousand body sherds that were in the dump piles that enabled us to, to date and say for sure that the majority of this is Iron Age I pottery, so maybe 1200, 1230, 1250 BC in that horizon, Israelite pottery, and then about 1% is from a century or more earlier, late Bronze Age pottery, and then a tiny bit of like later early Roman Hellenistic pottery that just kind of randomly ended up at the site. So that's kind of consistent with what I would expect because the Bible doesn't say that they kept using that altar. It says that Joshua conducted this ceremony there, not that it was continuously used. So we have a small amount of late Bronze Age cultic pottery, by the way, and then a large amount 
from when they later build this altar to venerate it. Imagine like there's something of historic significance and it happened in your youth and now you're no longer in your youth, you're, you're nearing the end of your life and you like say, we better go and like venerate that for future generations. They're not even going to know what happened there. We should build something in that, like a sort of memorial. And I think that's what they did. And of course, here we are with our computers in the field tracking the data. And of course, coffee, I mean, let's face it, in the civilized world, one should not be expected to read pottery without coffee, okay? So our, our coffee folks, I've got a lot of coffee jokes for you if you want them. You want to hear one? Okay, I'll tell you one. How does Moses make coffee? Hebrews, they're very good. All right. Y'all are good. All right. Ceramic profile is what I sort of explained to you a moment ago about the, the pottery profile. But let's talk about scarabs. Zertal found two scarabs. And the first one dated to Tutmosi the Third. Tutmosi the Third was the most powerful of all the pharaohs. That's 15th century B.C. He's the pharaoh of the oppression, by the way. He's the one who's oppressed and put the Israelites into slavery in Egypt, and this is his scarab. Now, that does not fit the date of folks that want to say that the Exodus and Conquest was in the 13th century. So if you heard me last night uh, when I was talking about Jericho, what did Kathleen Kenyon say about her 15th century B.C. scarabs? They must be commemorative scarabs. They're heirlooms. They can't possibly be, I mean, if they were from the time the Bible says, the Bible would be true. I mean, and we know that can't happen. So this, everyone agrees that that scarab is from the 15th century, but it must be an heirloom. It was made by later peoples, like a trading card or something like that. Based, who says and based on what? And, you know, when I talk to these leading glyptic scholars, I ask them, what criteria do you use to make this assessment? And they're like, well, we don't have any. It just seems like it fits better here than it fits there. Now, come on. <laughs> This is what I mean. We just want a level playing field uh, to deal with. The second scarab, and there's the scarab one that I was talking about. The second scarab, maybe I don't have a pic of it. It's, uh, it's this one on the right. The second scarab is, was, Zertal published, from Ramesses II. And if you watch the Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston, you may think he's the pharaoh of the Exodus. Boy, do you need to read your Bible. Uh, less Hollywood and more Bible. Ramesses was a great and powerful pharaoh, but he's two centuries too late to be the pharaoh of the Exodus. Um, and so, basically, Zertal and Baruch Brandel said, you know, this, this scarab it's not an heirloom. Notice when it fits their time frame, it's not an heirloom. It's not commemorative. So this one's right, but this one can't be because it contradicts our, our dating. So this proves when the altar was built. Two years ago, the leading scarab expert in Israel, her name is Daphne Bentor. She's the wife of the excavator of Hatsor, um, Amnon Bentor. And Daphne Bentor, who's in charge of the Egyptology section at the Israel Museum in Jerusalem, Daphne Bentor personally told me that she thinks that they dated that Ramesses the second scarab wrong, and it's also Tetmosu the third. Now that's not been published yet, okay? Except in my book, I footnoted it, you can see, but not professionally published yet. So Who's going to doubt Dafti Bentor? I certainly don't. They're both from Tutmosis the Third, and I guess they were both commemorative. Welcome to my world, okay? No, they're not commemorative. They're dating that lowest level of material right above bedrock exactly to the time that the Bible says the Israelites arrived. We've got chalices. We've got burned sacrificial material. We've got pottery from that time. And it all paints a very consistent picture. Proverbs 21, the first one to present his case sounds right until another comes along. Well, guess what? Another has come along. Now, I won't get into all the gory details of the scarabs, but these things are really interesting because the offerings that are left there, gold is incredibly scarce and rare. You do not often find it archaeologically because if you lose something gold, you keep looking until you find it. In our excavation at Kerbin Makater, Biblical Eye, 
we found 1,322 coins. That's a lot. That's more than any aside in Israel except Masada. And Masada doesn't really count because they took all their money with them when they went there. This is a regular site, 1,322 coins. Two gold coins, five silver, and everything else is bronze. Now do you see how scarce silver and gold were? When, when Peter and John told the beggar, silver and gold we don't have, they weren't kidding. I mean, silver and gold is scarce. And if you lost it, you went looking for it. You see how that gold earring? That's a big, beautiful gold earring. It's Egyptianized also. It wasn't lost at Mount Ebal. It was an offering. It was something of value that was left there. Again, indicating that it's a cultic site. Now, Deuteronomy 27, we read, And when you cross the Jordan, this is Moses speaking, set up these stones on Mount Ebal. As I command you today, and coat them with plaster. Zertal recovered a lot of plaster, and it's in a box in storage at Haifa University awaiting analysis. We're going to be a part of this analysis. It has never been exposed to infrared and ultraviolet light to see if there's writing that is on there. But isn't that fascinating? You've got it plaster at a site where the Bible says that they plastered over the stones. Build there an altar to the Lord your God, an altar of stones. Do not use any iron tool on them. Build the altar of the Lord your God with field stones and offer burnt offerings on it to the Lord your God. Sacrifice fellowship offerings there, eating them and rejoicing before the Lord your God. <coughs> Joshua 8.30. Then Joshua built on Mount Ebal an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the Israelites. He built it according to what was written in the book of the law of Moses. Talking about Deuteronomy an altar of uncut stones on which no iron tool had been used. On it they offered to the Lord burnt offerings and sacrificed fellowship offerings. So hallelujah for once they did what they were told. Now here's a look at Shechem. <clears throat> this is modern Nablus. And you know when you hear about sort of hot spots in the so-called West Bank, uh, this is always one of them. It's New, New, New Testament Neapolis. And this is where you get the name Nablus. But ancient Shechem, Tel Balat is in the center. The tomb of Joseph is here. The well of Jacob is here. The woman at the well in John 4. Mount Gerizim, Mount Ebal. So you get it? The Ark of the Covenant and the Levites are in the middle. They're, half the tribes are on Mount Gerizim, half are on Mount Ebal. This is where that covenant ceremony is taking place. Now, looking down at the city, you can kind of get an idea as it's a bit of urban sprawl. And here's Tel Balata. This is ancient Shechem. And this temple right here is actually mentioned in the Bible. This is the temple of Baal Berith that we read about in the book of Judges. And it has a large standing stone on it also right here. Now, I just filmed a new series with TBN when I was in Israel two months ago that is airing right now on Tuesdays at 3.30. So, have any of you seen that? One person, God bless you for raising your two. God bless you, sir. Okay, thank you for having mercy on me and raising your hand. Now, the rest of you on Tuesdays at 3.30 in the afternoon, you can catch this, the rest of this series. And uh, one of the places we filmed was here. And you can see me with my son right next to this, this standing stone, this Maseva. And this is looking down at the church where Jacob's well is and across at uh, Mount Ival. So it was blessings and curses. Uh, Moses, in Deuteronomy eleven twenty nine instructed the Israelites to pronounce blessings from Mount Gerizim and curses from Mount Ival. Deuteronomy 27, 12 through 13 indicates that they obeyed these instructions. All right, let's unpack this. <clears throat> the altar is on Mount Gerizim or on Mount Ebal? Mount Ebal. The blessings are on Mount Gerizim. The curses are on Mount Ebal. Why is the altar... On Mount Ebal. To me, this is one of those beautiful pictures that I've ever seen. I don't need the altar on Mount Gerizim in my life, or the place of blessing when everything's going well for me, when I'm on top of the world, when I'm walking in the Spirit, when I'm doing great. I need an altar when I've sinned, when I have violated God's commands, when I've hurt other people, when I need restoration. That's where I find an altar. And do you see where the altar is? It's on the place of failure, not on the place of blessing. And we should all take great comfort in that. That when we do sin, and remember what James 3, 2 says, we all sin in many ways. 
And when we do sin, that we have an altar that's there. It's a beautiful picture of that. And to, telling the world about this altar, I think, is a pretty awesome thing. Now, you get some perspective there at Tel Balata, ancient Shechem. Unfortunately, a lot of it's been destroyed by urban sprawl today, excavated by Harvard uh, about 100 years ago. And um, University of Chicago later worked there as well. Very large, ancient, and important site. Nobody wants to work there today because it's politically sensitive, politically difficult to do so. But there is the standing stone that I was telling you about. Massive walls. Uh, see how large that stone was? That wall is 4,000 years old, a little over 4,000 years old. Still standing. It's five meters wide. It's massive. Now, it had a mud brick superstructure on top of it that was equally big. So if you were an enemy trying to come, that's what you saw. So when the Israelites talk about wall, cities that are walled up to the heavens, this is what they were seeing. Now, what the Israelites did not know is that the population of Canaan had reduced by 75% at the time of the conquest due to climate change. So these had been big, impressive cities. They were built during the Middle Bronze Age, and now... They had cultural decline and a 75% reduction in population. These cities were barely hanging on, and God knew that, and he told them to go take it by faith. But as far as they knew, they were mighty giants living inside these cities. I mean, they're very hyperbolic, talking about, oh, the people who live in the land, they must be giants, and they built these cities who walled up to the heaven. From their perspective, they still had a slave mentality, you see. But God knew that these, these cities were ripe for the taking. That's the gate uh, of ancient Shechem, you can see the orthostats in the gate. This gives you some perspective of the site. Now back to the altar. This is a schematic of how the, the rectangular altar is, is created. Um, here's the, the actual rectangular cube. They want to make sure that they've got the round altar protected at the center. The only thing that matters about the rectangular altar is that it's venerating the earlier altar. You think the Dome of the Rock, the Muslim shrine on the Haram is Sharif, has some significance? The only thing that matters about that is that there's a rock in the middle of it where the Ark of the Covenant once sat and where Abram bound his son Isaac. That's why it matters. It's not that the structure itself is sacred. Now there you can see the round altar as they're beginning to construct and now they're going to fill in the earlier stratum, build these supporting walls intentionally to protect that earlier altar, and then ultimately this is what it looks like in the period of the judges. So during the period of the judges, people are coming here and they're, they're remembering that God did something in this place. God showed up here. Our ancestor Joshua built an altar here. In the period of the judges, they were worshiping in a lot of places. It wasn't just at Shiloh where the tabernacle was. This, you can see the ramp, and you can see where it's all filled in, and underneath there is that round altar. Here's Michael Ludini that I introduced you to with the video earlier. Michael was probably 84 at this point, and he'd never been to Mount Ebal, even though he'd been working in Israel all of his life, and so because it's very difficult to get to, so it was a joy to be able to take him there. Here's our winter team when we arrived on site at our headquarters, which is the Ritz Hotel. It's not as fancy as it sounds, don't worry. And, uh, but we arrive now, Pam, an army runs on its tummy, and my army runs on Quaker Oats. And so you can see that we have all brought our Quaker oats so that we can eat properly in the mornings. They can eat whatever else they want, but they're required to eat their oats. And uh, that way productivity soars. And um, I was also submitting a funding proposal to the Quaker Oats Foundation, so I thought this would be a good picture uh, to send to them. And uh, this is the hotel manager, Issa, who's a dear friend. Issa's Arabic for Jesus, of course. And anyway, that's part of our, our winter team. And then since it's the Ritz Hotel, everybody brought Ritz crackers also to give to Isa, our uh, dear friend. So we're trying to make a lot of friends along the way. Now here's the big find uh, that is rocking the world. Remember when Abraham Lincoln met Harriet Beecher Stowe, Lincoln being six foot five and Harriet Beecher Stowe being four foot ten, father being a very famous writer and her brother, the pastor of the largest church in America at the time. And she wrote this book called Uncle Tom's Cabin. And so when Lincoln met Stowe, he condescended and shook her hand and said, so you're the little lady who started this great big war. All right, well, here's the little bitty artifact that's going to shake up the world. 
we found in Zertal's dump pile a folded lead tablet that's about two and a half inches by two and a half inches. And as soon as I saw it, and we only found it by wet sifting. So we, when that's covered with dirt, it just looks like a stone chip, and you're seeing hundreds and hundreds of those every day. But once I saw it, I knew immediately that it was a curse tablet because it's what we call a defixial, and it, they write curses on these things, and then they leave them at, at a site. Now, they're normally more commonly found in the Hellenistic period, but... You know, they're found in other periods as well. And maybe this is from the Hellenistic period and someone knew this was Joshua's altar and they left this cursed tablet there. But it's also possible that it dates back all the way. We haven't finished our, our research on it yet, but you can see where it's folded. This tablet just returned from the University of Prague where it underwent tens of thousands of scans in their laboratory so that we can penetrate the lead and read the text that is on the inside. And so I am now going to tell you what I know, and here is what I know so far. There are two lines of text on this cursed tablet. The text is Hebrew. The first letter is Aleph. The basic Hebrew word for curse, Arur, which begin, begins with Aleph, Perhaps the next letters were as follows. Now, that's all I know right now. So, you know, it's, we're going to have to get, get now data processors to help us crunch all of these scans, and then we'll have to get epigraphists involved to help us understand the handwriting style so that then we can date it, regardless of what it says. I mean, in my perfect world, it's a curse from Deuteronomy 28, and it's on Mount Ebal, and it might be. But regardless of what it says, the fact that it's a curse tablet on Mount Ebal, do you see how significant that is? The Bible says that it's the mountain of the curse, that Joshua built an altar there, and what do we find? We find a curse tablet that's there. So at the very least, it's really big. If we have a curse from Deuteronomy, then it's earth-shattering. And if it's written with an epigraphic handwriting style earlier than any Hebrew that we have heretofore, then it will be like the Dead Sea Scrolls. We also found blades, and this blade is the rounded blade, which the Mishnah says in the sacrificial system, you don't use a pointed blade because this would bring suffering to the animal. You don't puncture the animal. You slice the, uh, the vital arteries. Um, a few flints that Zertal missed that were diagnostic-type flints from that time period. And then this enigmatic marking. Now, he published a bunch of handles with these dots on them. And nobody knows what they stand for, but they're unique to that time period. And right underneath it, do you see this? That's very symmetrical. Symmetrical things don't just occur in nature, okay? So this is symmetrical for a reason, and this is kind of what the pattern is. And am I just seeing things as that kind of a footprint shape? So... If, if it is, then that's going to be really, really interesting as we get deeper into it. This is called an all, like, you know, a, a slave wants, somebody wants to go from an indentured servant to a, a lifetime bond servant. Then he had, they, they drive an all through his ear. So this is very, very well preserved all. Which brings us back to Larry Stager. Professor Stager, as brilliant as he was, said this. If there's an altar on Mount Ebal, as Zertal claims, biblical scholars should all go back to kindergarten. Well, class is now in session. All right. Thank you for your attentiveness. Do we have time for questions, Pastor? All right. I'm going to let you use this and run around. I don't run anymore. Mm. If you see me running, shoot whatever's chasing me. <laughs> Do we have any questions? All right. Let's do five books, okay? Okay. Did you say 50 minutes? What was it? Um, the quote that's on the screen, what is the context behind that? Why was Professor Steger um, saying that you know, we should all go back to kindergarten if there is an altar there. Was there some kind of consensus that there's no way there? He disagreed with Zertal. Zertal had published this in Tel Aviv Journal, um, which is a, a peer-reviewed journal, a prestigious one. So the reaction to it, and scholars are reacting to that, and some are saying, 
uh, maybe, some are saying it can't possibly be. So Steger was of the opinion that this can't possibly be an altar on Manny Ball. And he, that's what he was, he was reacting to Zertal's publication. And I like this, by the way. I don't like groupthink. I, you know, we've got to find, let's hash it out. Let's throw it out there and, you know, churn it up. The butter will, butter will rise. Um, that's what was going on. Yes. Anybody else? Come on, make me run. Right here in the All middle. Right. So one of the first slides, I think, where you're talking about what Zertal had said, it said late 13th century, and then it said that the altar dated to the 13th century, right? And then, but you're saying that's what Zertal said, but your findings are more consistent with the 15th century. Is that correct? Am I understanding I agree with Zertal that the rectangular altar dated to the 13th century. What I'm saying is that the round altar, which is the whole reason that the rectangular altar was built, dates to the late 15th century, around 1400. Yes, good question. Anybody else? All right. You didn't work out here. No, I love All right. In a sentence or two, would you explain the archaeological proof for either the early date of the Exodus or the late date of the Exodus? <laughs> Just I, a sentence or two. Arche if, from an archaeological perspective. Why is it that they believe in the late date of the Exodus? Yes, I can. Okay. Other than the fact that they don't believe in the biblical numbers. The late date advocates 80 years ago did not believe that there was archaeological evidence that supported the biblical date. Right? W.F. Albright, the father of biblical archaeology, for example, only 1% of the land of the Bible had been excavated. Let's just let that sink in. With 1% of the land, now we've got 5% excavated. With 1% excavated, they felt like there was not evidence that supported the bill, and so we had to save God's reputation, and so we came up with this inglorious idea of what 480 doesn't really mean 480 years and so forth. That's the short answer. They felt like 80 years ago that there wasn't evidence that supported the biblical text. 80 years later, as you will see in my book, we've got abundant evidence. And this is why we don't... Archaeology illuminates the text. It doesn't change it for, for me, for an early date advocate. All right, one more. Anybody else? All right. And while uh, Tim's running over there, let me just remind you that I'll be sharing in our Sunday school time tomorrow sort of more of my personal story and then during the service about uh, five specific examples of how archaeology illuminates the text. C can you just explain your use of the word cultic when you were talking about the altars? Yes, good question. The word cultic means religious. So uh, you can have every religion has a cult. Uh, so we're talking, and cult, the word culture derives from the word cult. So when we're talking about our culture, it comes from religious values. And if it's not Moses' values, then whose is it, you know? So all cultures are based on, on a cultic understanding. And this is the fallacy of multiculturalism because they're in antipathy toward each other. So when I'm saying it's cultic, I just mean it's religious. Yeah, good question. I think we are out of time. Thank you for your attentiveness and for coming out today.